praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Which is code for find your way to your seats, please. <laughs> Attention. <laughs> We got all day. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I um, want to report on our, our adventure outside the church last night. Um, the worship team was invited to, to, to participate in a 24-hour prayer burn at um, Kingdom House of Prayer in Ankeny at the Heartland Assembly of God there. Um, we went and we did a two-hour set towards the end of their session. And um, I think that the takeaway is praise God that we're where we are that we have the revelation that we do, that we are no longer striving to earn God's grace, to earn righteousness, and uh, that our prayers are no longer to be worthy of his glory. And, um, you know, there, I, I, you know, we walked in and there was a, a group of people praying fervently to make them worthy of God's glory, to make them worthy of his presence. And I heard so many of my old prayers in their prayer before we were given revelation. It's a precious gift to know that we have received that righteousness as a gift, that we are holy in his sight because it is no longer us who live, but Christ who lives in us. Yes. And the life that we now live is in him, yes. through him, for him, and by him. Yes. What a precious, precious gift. Um, it was not our normal worship set. It was hard work in an atmosphere that wasn't um, prepared as the ground is here. Um, poor Mike was sweating it out. <laughs> but, but Tammy, you know, Tammy, I think Tammy said that she felt like there was a shock in her mouth. And, you know, it was so hard to hear the voice of the Lord that is so present here. It was, um, the ground was watered. Yeah. And again, it just made us, I think, all thankful that we are where we are. So. Um, more work to do, more um, revelation. We are the ones that should shine that light. We spoke the word in that place. We encourage people through song and worship and um, spiritual song. And, and uh, we just expect God to uh, bring the increase in that ground. So praise the Lord. Good to be home this morning. <laughs> we, were, we were rehearsing going, this is what we sound like. <laughs> it's not just us when we're here, right? Uh, anybody have any prayer requests or any testimonies this morning they'd like to share? Yeah, she um, did. Yeah, I got a call this morning. Evelyn is out of Niagara Bush and having a lot of heart issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So pray for Evelyn that her heart will settle. And, uh, <coughs> yeah, Evelyn. Yeah, uh, my good news to Miss Nell is when I was having a real hard time wanting to go back to work. <laughs>
Paul is saying that it becomes a condition of with all your heart, all doubt has to be erased. It, it's not really a thought, it's a feeling. You yes. know that you know yes. that you know yes. it's done. Yes. Just as sure as you know that, that the sun, that's the sun. Mm -hmm. and he will never forsake us yeah. to the yeah. end. Yeah. Instead of, mm. it, it, he has divine protection for us. Right. Absolutely. Yes. It shall not come nigh thee. It can be all around us, but it cannot come nigh thee. Hallelujah. That's where it says. Hallelujah. Amen. He is more than enough in all things. Anyone else have any prayer requests or any thoughts? Yes, Jean. Let's go to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, we just come before you this morning. One body, one mind, and one accord, Lord. We thank you for the revelation of grace, Lord, the revelation of who you are, of your great love for us, Lord. Thank you that your arm is not short, Lord, that you are more than enough, Lord. 
thank you that you have done all that needs to be done to live an abundant life for every believer that would put their faith and their trust in you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that it is finished, that the work of faith, that the work of righteousness, that the work of holiness, it is finished, that you finished it once for all. And I thank you, Lord, that now we rest, we trust in you and we rest in your finished work as conquerors, victorious, whole. Lord, that we live the abundant life with peace that passes understanding, Lord. That we don't even have to think. We don't even have to wonder. We don't have to worry. That those fears and those doubts that come from our flesh that say you're not enough, to say that you're not enough, those lies are silenced, that we silence those lies, we cast them down as lies. Lord, we trust that you are more than enough, Lord. We trust that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us, Lord, that whatever happens in this world, the wars rage all around us, the people are falling in our right and our left, Lord, that it cannot come near us cannot touch us, Lord, that not even our heels shall stumble, that you watch over us, that we rest in you, Lord, the gift of your grace, the wisdom, the revelation of who you are and who you have made us, new creatures, a new creation, a new race. Lord, that we are not conformed to this word, but we are transformed. We renew our minds by your word, by your spirit. Lord, that we lean not on our own understanding. We do not know the end from the beginning, but you do. Jesus, that you make the way before us. That we just simply live and walk and have our being in you trusting, Lord, that every move we make in you, Lord, will lead us and guide us into victory. We give you praise. We give you honor. And it is all for your glory, Lord. Thank you as you release your kingdom, your heavenly kingdom on this earth as it is in heaven. As we speak your word, Lord, be our lips, be our words, Lord. Open our eyes to see and open our ears to hear what you would do, Father. That all that we say and do come from you. Oh, that you are glorious. That you are gracious. That your mercy is new every day, Lord. that's interested in uh, teaching or um, helping with the Sunday school, we're going to have meetings uh, the next few services afterwards. If anybody has any questions, uh, we're trying to fill up our fall schedule with teachers and helpers. So stick around if you're interested. speak the word this morning. 
Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. Lord. I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened, and I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. John and Don, if you two would like to come take the offering this morning. Don, you want to ask the blessing, please? Again, I want to thank the uh, worship team for going out beyond these walls and those that had come and stand in, stood in the gap with us where we went. Um, I think I believe it was strategic and uh, we answered the calling. Okay, uh, All the scriptures that we were led to read last night were already proclaimed in this realm. Uh, the Lord specifically says, I want you to grab scriptures that were um, released in this atmosphere when pastor was preaching. Every scripture we talked about had been declared in this room. And as the words were going out, we felt some resistance, but that's okay. Because light's stronger than darkness. Amen. Okay? And open eyes can see more than blind eyes. Open ears can hear more than deaf ears. Amen. All right? Amen. <clears throat> so I thank the worship team for pressing forward um, the kingdom of God does not retreat um, worship we've already had worship these testimonies everybody calling out talking out this morning this is what church is about yes. with you not here we don't get to hear it Amen. and there are those that are not here this morning that have testimonies that we need to hear when you are gone Part of us is missing. So everyone here, including Eric, <laughs> um, are vital. Yes. And God wants to release so much more. Yes. And there's so much more to be released. And I know even the children and the youth have a word to speak of the Lord as we press in. As we stay in the atmosphere, the Holy Spirit will release. We'll, we'll, we're going to see amazing things through, Amen. yes, you all here right now. But the children and the young adults and stuff are going to have words to bring to us that he wants to bring fresh. He said, come as to me, unto me as a child. And we're going to hear these words. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to freak us out. But so what? In the meantime, we're going to worship the Lord. We're going to thank him for what he's done. Their flags and tab rays, dance, shout, jump. Uh, we don't have chandeliers. 
on purpose. So grab a fan and swing. <laughs>
name, I just can't stop. Praise his name, I just can't stop. Come on. Praise his name, Jesus. Can't stop. Praise his name, I just can't stop. Praise his name, I just can't stop. Praise his name, Jesus. Can't stop. Praise his name, I just can't stop. Praise his name, I just can't stop. Praise his name, Jesus.
Pastor, can I have five minutes? Real, real quick. I get it, and of course it is a genetic thing, and it's, oh, hallelujah, but uh, uh, the truth is the Holy Spirit's going to do what the Holy Spirit wants to do, just a question of us, you know, being sensitive enough to allow him to do that, and I don't think that I'm big enough to mess up what the Holy Spirit wants to do, right. amen. amen, hallelujah, but I was thinking when, uh, when Debbie was talking about this uh, situation, and it sounds you know, I know, then you kind of feel like, I'm <laughs> uh, geez, I was so stupid, you know. But the truth is, you're not stupid. You just don't know everything, yep. you know. Right. And uh, this, it brought to my mind, when, when Debbie was talking about this, Sally and I replaced some storm windows on the second story of our house. 
Now, it's not a huge house. It's a, you know, like Cape Cod, but second-story windows are still, you know, 25 feet up there or whatever. So I get the ladder, naturally. I get to climb the ladder, and she's inside kind of hanging out and, of course, telling me what to do. <laughs> that is her job, you know. But anyhow, so I take the glass out of these storm windows. Now, the original storm windows in the house, they don't make them anymore. Right? How many of you have ever been down that road? You know, you, as soon as you buy them, then they just continue them. So anyway, we've, we've had these for 15, 16 years that we've lived there. So I take the glass out because I'm not comfortable trying to carry a whole window with the glass and the screen and everything else in it up this ladder for fear that I'll drop the glass and break it, and then I'll be out the window anyway. So, so I take the glass out. And I'm thinking now, originally, the storm windows were flush with the house. You know, they just were just flush. That's the way they were made. So when these came out, we had to buy kind of a universal window that would fit the same space, but in a little bit different way. So I take the glass out. Now I don't know which is inside and which is outside. But I'm assuming the outside is going to be flush, because that's the way it used to be, right? So I get it up there, and we're jockeying the thing around, and, and uh, thank God for grace. We really needed grace that day. If you ever work with your wife, sometimes we just don't think the same. You know, we got different ways of doing things, and, and both of us think our way is the right way. And so anyway, we're trying to get, and I just could not get it to go in all the way at the top. It would go in fine along the sides and at the bottom, but in the top it was, it was still sticking out about this far. So being, yeah, and I had already cocked it, you know, so I got caulking everywhere and trying to get this thing, but it, would, it wouldn't go in. So I take it back down the ladder and I said, okay, this is after about an hour of trying to make this one window fit. <laughs> so I take the thing back down and I said, I, I, I just think the only way to do this is to trim the bottom, you know, because it'll still fit and then it'll slide in there and it'll be tight everywhere around. So I get it in, we take it over and got it on the bench and I had Sally draw the line because I, I don't draw straight lines very well, but she got the square and she put a straight line right where we wanted it to be. And I'm cutting along with the tin snips and I'm halfway down through the window and she says, that's backwards. <laughs> that window's backwards. You wouldn't be able to get the windows out. You wouldn't be able to open them from the inside the way we were trying to put it in. So I was really grateful for the revelation now that I've ruined this window. <laughs> but I thought, okay, we'll put, the other one, the, we'll put this good one on the north side, and then the other one we'll put on the south side because it'll still fit. It's just going to have a little bit of a gap. Not, not an opening, but, you know, a gap from the, from the frame uh, where it would otherwise have been tight. It will still screw in. It'll still be tight all the way around. It just won't be as flush. So I lay awake all night long naturally over this one stupid window and I thought, you know, I'm not going to do that. This, this is too much work to halfway the thing. And I'll just go buy another window. So the next morning I'm back down to Lowe's and I get the other window, I bring it back out. Of course, it went in fine. But here's the point of all of this. A common mistake that, that people make when they're trying to design something that's foolproof, and this is what the guys tell you when you go buy these things. It's foolproof. There's nothing to it. The problem is, well, two, but the common mistake that we make is when we try to design something that's completely foolproof is that we underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools. I'm going to make this thing fit if I have to totally redesign it because that's what I do. You know, I just... So it took three windows to fill two holes, but I do have a backup. If anybody breaks any of my glass, I've got another one. So there you go. <laughs> I hope you feel better. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, the only reason I brought it up, because I know it's probably already all over the internet. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, hallelujah. Amen. You know, God's in a good mood. He's not mad. He, his anger has been poured out on Jesus. Amen. He's not mad at anybody anymore. 
If you don't believe that, look around the world and you would have to say, if God is angry, if he's going to get people, boy, I mean, we would all be in a mess. Everybody, not just people we don't like, not just bad, what we consider to be bad people, but everybody would be in trouble. It's grace, this dispensation of grace that we live in that is restraining God's otherwise anger at sin. He doesn't like sin. He, does, he hasn't compromised on sin. It's just that Jesus has paid the price for sin for every one of us who believe in him. And under this dispensation, there'll be no judgment until every person gets their opportunity to accept or reject. When that happens, we're going to be out of here. Pre-trip, mid-trip, post-trip, I don't know and I don't care. I'm just looking for Jesus. And if I'm here doing some of the mess, and I expect that we probably will because as I look around, there's a mess going on everywhere. It just isn't necessarily affecting me at this moment. But there are other Christians around the world that are being beheaded and lots of other horrible things are happening to them. So to them, I suspect they're believing the tribulation has come. So it, the scripture doesn't tell us that it happens instantaneously worldwide. It just happens. So we'll all be, I suspect, affected to some degree. But look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. He is our support. He is our protection. And as Paul said, the worst thing is still the best thing. Amen? To, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Amen? So that's the way we have to be thinking. That's the way we have to stay focused. And I mean, if, if people, if everybody could feel what this small group of people felt this morning, and I, I, I suspect everybody felt what I felt, as we're worshiping, there's such a freedom, such a, a sense of, of love and connection. That's the way God feels about us. I feel bad for people who don't experience that, who haven't known that. I feel bad for people who only think of God as being a judge. I lived there. I mean, I tell, I, I, that's where my background in Christianity began, you know. And uh, I don't... I, I still have many, many friends in other denominations and, and uh, organizations that I was a part of. But I've experienced a Jesus that they really don't know. Even though they have much revelation about God and things of God, they don't have the true revelation of God in Christ. What Jesus has really done has set us free from guilt and condemnation. He became sin so that we become the righteousness of God in Christ. Now the problem is we still look at each other as we are in the flesh, the body, the, you know, the actions, the behaviors. But the good news is God doesn't look at you that way. God, is, God hates sin as much today as he did in the book of Genesis. The difference is he has already judged the believer's sin in Christ. If that weren't true, he could not dwell in you. He cannot be in the same place with sin. That's what separated us from God in the first place. So how, we, how do we confess and believe that Christ is in me, the hope of glory, right? Unless I am a new creation. And if I'm measuring this righteousness based on my external behavior and even my thoughts, as Jesus put it, if you look on a woman or if you hate somebody, it's the same as murder or adultery, then, buddy, we're all lost. We're all sunk. He set the standard so high that nobody could keep it, which was the original intent of the law in the first place, right? So we have to recognize that what got born again was my spirit. That's what's eternal. That's what's going to live forever. One day, I'll get a glorified body that will match that spirit. But right now, I'm stuck with this one. And it, it'll go the way of all flesh at some point. Either through the rapture, it gets transformed, or through natural death, and it'll just go back to the dust from where it came. Amen? But I'm not going to die. I'm going to live forever, and you'll never die. Praise God. Amen. 
But you've got to believe that. You know, that's just that's a faith thing. And it isn't, it isn't complicated, and it isn't some great intellectual endeavor. It's just simply believe it. You don't have to dwell on it. You don't have to focus on it. You don't have to try to parse it and figure it all out and rationalize it. Just believe it. Amen? So let's look at a few scriptures here. And I'm going to be brief this morning. That's why I rambled on a little bit about my storm window experience. But thank the Lord for the Holy Ghost. My biggest fear was not the windows. It was me falling off the ladder. Because I do not like, I used to work, I used to do some roofing and I did a lot of carpentry work when I was much, much younger. And, uh, then I didn't, of course, you, you know, until you fall 20 or 30 times, it's not a big deal. And when you fall when you're 25, exactly. you pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and start all over again. When you're 65, yeah. you're call 911. <laughs> That's right. Amen. So, hallelujah. Okay, May, uh, let's start with Matthew chapter 5. And we'll read verses 43 through 46. Appreciate everybody being here this morning. And uh, I, I, like I said, I'm going to try to be brief. Actually, I've got a couple of fairly long scriptures to read. But just because I want you to see what God is saying about this. And this is not my interpretation of what God is saying or has said. It's literally what the Bible says. So here in uh, Matthew chapter 5, he says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And persecute you, that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his sun to shine on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same. Now, I don't know about anybody else in here, but I got a problem with those verses of Scripture. I got a problem keeping those verses of scripture. Now I can say I love my enemies. I can make a mental assent to that, but the truth is something deep down inside of me likes to see them get punished. I know y'all are much more spiritual than I am, but we we can lie to ourselves and others that we're so righteous and so holy, but I know better and so does God. I want to do the right thing, but just like Paul, I don't always do it. I have good intentions, but sometimes people just really tick me off. Amen? And it's hard for me to love them. It's hard for me to love a Muslim who has just beheaded some Christian. Because I'm a human being. And I just want to get even. I just want to pay back and let them experience what that's like. Amen? All right, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Seven and eight. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, what both of these sections of Scripture are talking about is a revelation of God. It's a revealing of God. Jesus is saying, this is, this is the demand, or this is what, what you should be doing. I know what you're doing, but this is what you should be doing. Why? Because this is the way God thinks. God loves his enemies. If that weren't true, none of us would be saved. He's not telling us to do something weird or strange. He's telling us, he's, he's more interested in telling us the nature and showing us the nature of God than he is about getting us to perform. 
He's trying to reveal God. That's what Jesus came here for. He was a, the exact representation. He is the revelation of God in flesh. So he's trying to get us to understand God. Not us. We already know us. We just don't know God. We've got distorted images of God. We've got perverted understanding of God that he's angry, that he's mad, that he's going to get you, and he's, going to, he's just waiting for the chance to maim you and to destroy your life and put you into poverty and cause you to be cancerous and everything else because you're such a jerk. And Jesus is trying to show us that that's what we are. We're people that despise our enemies. He's revealing things to us. But he's saying that's not the way God is. God is not like your humanity. Jesus was the only human like God. And he went about doing good for everybody. Sinners, it didn't matter. If they would believe, he responded to them with love. Okay, now here's the actual text that I want to use this morning. John chapter 8, and we'll read verses 30 through 37. And this is, this is an explanation of this, of Jesus dealing with people who thought they, were, they had it all together. People who would have said, when I just read what I read, yeah, absolutely, that's what we do, that's what I do, knowing all along that that wasn't the way they were really, that's just the way they presented themselves and wanted everybody else to believe that they were. With all the laws, with all the rules, with all the regulations. Amen? So, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, If you continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. Praise the Lord. 30 through 37, so we'll just keep going. And ye shall know the truth, the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We be Abraham's seed. Sorry. We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. Now, just leave that there for a second, if you will, Sheila. This whole interaction here that's taken place and the words that Jesus is speaking are being spoken to religious Jews, to law keepers. Right? Now, the strength of sin is the law. According to the scripture. Adam and Eve, had God not said, he said, you can eat of any tree in this place, anything you want except the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, when the devil came, what was the temptation? It wasn't about any other tree. No. It was about the one thing that they couldn't have. The temptation was to have the thing that you're not supposed to. That's what the law does. That's the reason for the law, to show us that we're sinners. Tell me I can't do something. And I'm going to, I'll break my back to try to do it. Yeah. Because subconsciously, we're rebels. Yeah. We, we want what we can't have. And that was the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was to show you that whatever is a no-no, yeah. you're going to want to do-do. Yeah. That sounded right. <laughs> That's what Paul said. Paul said, until I saw the law that thou shalt not covet, I didn't covet. It wasn't a big deal for me. Amen? But now that I've been told I can't, all I can think about is what somebody else got I don't have or that, uh, you know, I'm lacking something or, I, or whatever it might be. He, he said, that just stirred up in me sin. Wasn't yep. that the sin wasn't there. It's just that it, ex it was exposed the moment he was told no. That's the reason for the law, to bring us to the end of ourselves. So that we know we got to have a Savior because we can't keep the law, in spite of what many religious people try to tell you today. You get saved by grace, and then they tell you you got to live your life such and such a way, and, and, and keeping these commandments and these rules and so on and so forth. 
If that were the case, then Paul wouldn't have had to writ, write the letter to the Galatians. Having begun in the spirit, are you now so foolish as to think that you can continue under the law? Right? So he, these guys are saying, look, we're not in bondage to anything. He's trying to tell them, you're in bondage to your religion, to sin, and to the law. And they're saying, hey, look, we're not, we're not born of fornication. In other words, we're not bastards. We know who our father is. Right? right? We're Abraham's seed. Right. Praise the Lord. Nothing is so insensitive and confrontational or cruel as a religious person whose doctrine is challenged with truth. Now I can tell you that, and most of us have experienced this at some point in our Christian life. Amen? When a person's religious identity is challenged, it gets ugly fast. C.S. Lewis said, of all bad men, religious bad men are the worst. Amen. I've had sinners mad at me, and I've had, quote, saints mad at me. Yeah. I'll take the sinner every time. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. You, they get over stuff. <laughs> Religious people, they, they never forget. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's move on, <laughs> Sheila, to verse 38 through 43. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham's our father. Jesus said unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. What were the works of Abraham? Abraham was before the law. The only thing Abraham did was believe God. And God counted it to him as righteousness, the same thing that he does for us in our belief in Christ. Right? But now you seek to kill me. A man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? And then he answers his own question. Because you can't hear my word. Praise God. In other words, he said, uh, in, the, in the words of a great spiritual mind, Jack Nicholson, <laughs> you can't handle the truth. I mean, you can't handle it. And here's why you can't handle it. Because Jesus didn't come to show you your faults. He came to fix them, to eradicate them. But they didn't understand it because they thought the whole thing was about exposing fault and failure and sin and whatever else they might describe it as. Jesus came to show us that even when we choose to live in religious rejection, God is still in restoration. He doesn't conform to our religious you know, doctrines and identities and so on and so forth. He stays where God is. God's involved in restoration, reconciliation. You can have all the, the Jesus rejection, God rejection, and you say, well, no, no, I've never, I would never reject. That's exactly what you do. That's exactly what people do when they put themselves under the law or demand legal behavior from other people. That's a rejection of the cross. It's a rejection of God's grace. It's a rejection of the love of God. In spite of what we try to call it. <laughs> what we do with this restoration and redemption and reconciliation is up to us. But what he has done isn't up for negotiation. Because it is finished. Praise the Lord. You can choose rejection, but you don't get the last word. 
Praise the Lord. Uh, let's look at uh, John uh, chapter 12, verses 47 through 50. You can reject grace. You can reject the finished work of the cross. But it's still the truth. But the rejecting of it keeps you in bondage because it's the truth that sets you free. It's the truth that makes you free. And, I, you know, coming from a religious background, I always struggled with that scripture because I thought, look, okay, the truth is, you know, I'm born again, and now God expects me to keep these commandments, you know, that I need to really do good and be good and all that stuff. I don't feel free because I, just like Paul, I want to do the right thing, but I usually screw up. I usually don't do the right thing, or I'll do the right thing after I've already done the wrong thing a few times, then I'll figure it out that I was wrong, and now I need to make it right. So you're always in a cycle of guilt and condemnation and repentance and begging for forgiveness and start it all over again, only to fail again and then to feel even more of a failure, even more condemnation and guilt which is not what God was interested in in the first place. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. That's God speaking through the mouth of Jesus. Do you understand? get that? If any man hears my words and doesn't believe, it chooses not to believe or just doesn't believe, he's not judging them. Because I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. God did not present himself as a judge. He presents himself as a savior from judgment. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him already. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say, and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Praise the Lord. Now, what's he talking about? Anybody who doesn't accept grace, salvation by grace, and then a life that is directed by grace, will be judged by the law because there's only one other place to go. You're either saved by grace or you're still required to meet the demands of the law, which nobody can do. Now, that's not God judging people. He's made a way of escape from judgment. God's not judging them. The law will judge them. The law that they want to embrace the very law that keeps them from hearing about the goodness of God and the love of God and the grace of God. Praise the Lord. See, God has acted on his goodness. Praise the Lord. He acted on his goodness, not on my badness. Right? Praise the Lord. His goodness is always bigger than than our badness. <laughs> Hallelujah. Look, uh, let's look at that. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Because it's in the Bible. It's scripture. Moreover, the law entered that the offense, the offense might abound. That's what I was talking about before. Wherever there's a law, now all of a sudden sin's revealed because you didn't know it was necessarily that it was sin before until you couldn't do it. Now it's exposed, right? But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. God's goodness is always greater than our badness. No matter how bad you've been. No matter how bad you are. No matter how bad you might be tomorrow. God's goodness, I know everybody gets nervous now because you're giving people a license to sin. Look, churches are filled with people trying to do the right thing. And they're sinning every day multiple times a day. So not having a license to sin has not stopped them from sinning. The truth is, 
It's only through grace that we can enter into a relationship with God where we understand his acceptance of us and we can love him, not based on how good I am, but how good he is. How much he loves me in spite of when I'm not doing good and when I'm bad and everything else. His, his affections don't rise and fall like a barometer or a, you know, a, a temperature gauge of some kind based on whether I'm running hot or cold. It's based on his continuous unfailing goodness. Yes. Praise God. Amen. Look, look at Zechariah chapter 7 verse 9. Because people love to go to the Old Testament then and when they can't find something in the New Testament to use to make you afraid or to kind of show you that God's like this and then they'll go back to the Old Testament. But believe me, the God in the Old Testament is the same as the God in the New Testament. He didn't change anything. Jesus is God in the flesh. Amen. He didn't, he didn't come along. He's just a nicer version of God. He is God. He is the revelation of the eternal, almighty God. So thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, execute true judgment. Everybody, want, How many of you want true judgment? Show mercy, compassion to every man and his brother. Now that's almost a paraphrase of what he said in Matthew. Love your neighbor. Hate, don't hate your enemy. Love your, love your enemy. Right? So this is, this is how God sees it, which is why Jesus said what he said in Matthew and, and in 1 John. Show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. Now, of course, the disciples, being good Jews, they said, who's my brother? Everybody. Who's my neighbor? Everybody. Who's your daddy? Sorry. <laughs> Show mercy and compassion. That is God's nature. <clears throat> to show mercy and to show compassion is the nature of God. Yeah. It's not a distortion. It's not some, gee, I, I wish it was this way so that I could get away with a bunch of stuff. This is how it is. This is, what the, this is how he's defined. By his own word, by the living word. God's justice does not require him to pay back those who have done wrong. He just said, execute true judgment. God's justice does not demand that he pay back those that have done wrong. Instead, in him, justice is grace. Justice is great. That doesn't mean people aren't going to be judged. They're not going to be judged by the nature of God or the goodness of God. They're going to be judged by a rejection of that love that leaves them with nothing but the law. The law is not the nature of God. The law exposes the nature of man. God's nature is compassion and mercy. Grace. And grace isn't fair. It just isn't. I like that little play. Justice. But grace isn't fair. It just isn't. Praise the Lord. It's justice as far as God's concerned. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 23. There are people everywhere today that are doing bad stuff. I mean, you know, bad stuff that religious people would identify as bad stuff. Not bad stuff like what I do. Because <laughs> my bad stuff isn't that bad. <clears throat> yeah, it is. There's no, there's no, you know, big sin, little sin, white sin, black sin. It's just sin. It's either compliance or it's Disobedience. So my, what religious people might look at my mess ups and say, well, they, you know, just repent and, you know, it's, it's okay. And then they might look at the person who lives next door to me that's doing something else that's on high on the list of don't do's in the church, in the religious group. And man, these, oh, poor, they, they are, who come out from among them and be you separate, you know, and yeah. touch not the unclean thing. <laughs> God sees us identically the same. Yeah. 
The only difference, the only thing that separates me from the rankest, worst, horrible sinner in the world is that I have believed in the grace of God through the person of Jesus Christ. That's the only difference. Therefore, God sees me in light of Jesus. And he still has to deal with them in light of the law. Only difference. Doesn't mean God doesn't love them because God so loved the world before anybody had ever done anything. Before anybody was anybody. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So don't confuse this into thinking that it's just because we're better people that God loves us. That has nothing to do with it. He loves us because we have chosen to believe in this love. That's the only difference. We preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block. Under the Greeks foolishness. Under the philosophers it sounded silly. It's the same today. You go to any college campus or any quote unquote intellectual and this is all just foolishness. It's just, you know, doesn't meet their high intellectual standards. God said that's foolishness to him. Amen. But nevertheless, to the Jews or to the religious people, a stumbling block. And that word is actually scandalon. It's where we get our word scandal from. To the Jews, what Christ was preaching was scandalous. That God would require that they keep the law, that they do this and they do that, and they go. And, and Jesus is saying, no, it's free. God loves you. Just accept his love. And the slate is erased. Not just past, but present and future. And the Jews said, it's a stumbling block for us. The reason it was a stumbling block, it was scandalous. It was unheard of. It's to, to this day that's true. You, you, it, it, to, to take this to the extreme, Paul said, look, if you don't preach it to the point that people think you're giving license to sin, then you're not really preaching it. Right. We're more worried about somebody getting away with something that we have no control over in the first place than we are about it presenting Jesus in the truth. Well, what if they do this? Or what, what if they do? It's not. It's no skin off your back. Right. Has nothing to do with you. It's between them and God. Right. And if God's okay with it, what are you worried about it for? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I understand with family because we all do this. We know there are consequences of bad behavior. I'm not talking about judgment from God. I'm just talking about, you know. Turn left on a red light, you're liable to meet with a motorcycle or something. Right. And go to jail or lose your license or cause a horrible injury or whatever. Right? right. That's not God. Right. That's a poor choice. The consequences are the choice. Right. Same way we go out here, and I've said it many times, you go out and rob a liquor store and the cops bust you. That's not the judgment of God. God's love for you hasn't changed at all. The law just busted you. The law just got you for breaking a law. <laughs> It's the consequences of behavior. Go up and punch somebody in the face and then be shocked that they beat you to a pulp. <laughs> Unless you're a lot bigger than them. Which seems to be the way to go anymore. You know. <laughs> the woman, the kid, the whatever. You know. Praise the Lord. Now, that's another thing. Jesus' life is a testament to a grace that transcends fairness. His whole life, that's what he's doing. He's expressing this unfair, this scandalous, this unheard of grace, this God favor, this God love. Praise the Lord. That's exactly the reason that he infuriated the religious moralists of his day. That's why he said... All I've done is tell you the truth, and the truth is about the love of God, and you want to kill me. And I'm telling you, his message of grace still infuriates 
the religious moralists. Because it's not fair. Look at all that I've been doing. I've done, I, I, I've, oh man. You know, look what I, I did. I gave this up. I don't have one of those. I don't go there. I don't do this. I don't have that. I don't look at all the sacrifices I've made. It can't be right that God would love that person who hasn't given up anything. The same way he loves me, who has given so much, sacrificed, and whatever. Praise the Lord. You know, Jesus just showed the sharp distinction between grace and human fairness. This was a God man. This wasn't a man man. This was a God man. And he slices right to the heart, right to the bone and to the marrow of what we think of as human fairness. It doesn't fit with grace. Matthew chapter 20, and we're going to read the first 15 verses of this. I said I got a couple of these that are fairly long, but just to have it all in context in case there's somebody here that hasn't heard this parable or seen it. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 15. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise this, the is, Lord. this is why it's called good news. Yes. Praise God. For the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven now, is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw another, others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I'll give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And then about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle. And he said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They said unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that ye shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last to the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. These are the last persons that went out to the field, worked for an hour. But when the first came, they'd been there all day, ten hours or something. When they first came, they, they supposed that they would receive more. They'd heard these guys that only worked an hour got a penny. And they're thinking, that's what we agreed to originally, so surely he's going to give us a whole bunch more because look at how hard we worked all day long. That they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. <laughs> oh, yeah, they were upset. These slackers come in at the last minute, didn't do anything, and they're getting the same benefit that I worked all day and spent my whole life trying to be perfect and righteous and holy and blah, 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 blah. That's not right. This isn't right. When they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto the last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil because I'm good? Praise the Lord. And that isn't about laboring in the cornfield or the bean field or the place that you work. This is about trying to get to heaven and thinking there should be a greater reward for me because I, I did it all. I mean, I, 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 I towed the line. You understand what I'm saying here is that many, many very good people believe this way. They love God. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying they don't love God. I'm not saying that they're not saved. I'm saying that they're making it about them and not about God. 
about what they do and have done as opposed to what God has done. That's the story behind this parable. The point of the parable. Jesus, we, we get these ideas that Jesus was this, oh, he didn't want to offend anybody. And well, praise the Lord. You know, have anybody ever, you know, you know, pastors and other people who are religious people and they just, God, the Lord bless you and the Lord loves you. And, yes. Oh, the Lord's so, so heavenly around me. <laughs> praise the Lord. Most of the people that I tell that I'm a preacher, if they've known me any length of time before, they, they go, oh, my God, really? <laughs> You're kidding. Uh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. The reason for the parable, and you see this, Jesus doing this all the time in these interactions with, the, with religious people. The reason for the par parable was to provoke outrage from religious people that were obsessed with fairness, with human fairness. The insistence on fairness, and listen close, is really an exposure of self-righteousness. That's what Jesus was trying to get them to understand. Your self-righteousness is not going to get you anywhere. You're either going to accept the grace of God or you're going to be left to do everything, cross every T, dot every I, and do it all perfectly, which nobody can do, which is the reason Jesus came in the first place, to fulfill the demands of the law. I mean, do you really want what's fair? I don't. I promise you. I don't want fair. I want grace. Amen. Jesus said it this way, let him who is without sin cast the first vote for fairness. And they all went away deciding not to vote on that particular issue. Religious concepts of fairness leads to the idea, and we've all experienced this, but listen to what I'm saying. The, this, this religious concept or, or idea of fairness leads to the idea that we have to offer something to God. Rededication. All you that have not lived perfect, I want you to come and rededicate your life. Is there anything wrong with rededication? No, but I'm saying it's the concept of this, un, this fairness issue that causes us to think that that's going to change something. Or, or, or you need to get this person rehabilitated. This Christian needs to be, re, they need to repent. They need to fast. They need to go on a 30-day uh, you know, cleansing or something and get their act together and really do some good works and some good deeds and get involved in something and do something more. But the problem is, that's idolatry. <clears throat> yeah. That idea is idolatrous. This messes with religion. This is what I'm saying, that that's why there's hostility when you start talking about these things. Not because I'm trying to be mean or I'm trying to be judgmental and crit critical of these other people. I'm saying we all got problems. But the answer is Jesus, not me rededicating or me rehabilitating myself in some way and, you know, going to fix it all up so that now God will accept me again. That's idolatry. It's an effort to make some kind of contribution when, in fact, I've got nothing to, con to contribute. I'm trying to offer something natural to this supernatural God when I've got nothing to offer him. If, if there is a transaction, it's one-sided. God has already done it all on our behalf. The only thing left for us to do is to believe that it's really finished. 
All right, we'll finish with this rather lengthy scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 13. Uh, every time you go to a wedding, you'll hear this. <laughs> I've used it in uh, lots of weddings, praise the Lord. Thank goodness about us, right? Charity, and first of all, we know that the, the, the actual word is love. It's, it's used as charity here, but the word is literally, it's love. So love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love bondeth not itself, is not puffed up. Now remember, God is love. This isn't about a man and a woman who are going to get married. It, it, it can be. It can be applied that way, but that's not the original intent of this. This is trying to show us God. This is the Word. This is Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word became flesh. The Word is still alive. Amen. When someone who is a believer reads it, 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 it is quickened by the Holy Spirit. It comes alive again. That's what we call revelation. So love suffereth long. It's a revelation of God. Everything here is a revelation of God. Doesn't mean that we don't, just because we don't understand it, it's not, everything's not revelation just because you read it. Right. It's revelation when, by the Holy Spirit, God is revealed to you right. through whatever it is. And, and he's in everything that's in this book. So love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. You could put God in there. God suffereth long and is kind. God envieth not. God vaunteth not himself, is not puffed up. God's just who he is. He's not proud. He doesn't have to be. Right. Doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Just think of Jesus on the cross right there. Right. Love never fails. God never fails. Right. He'll never leave you or forsake you. He cannot fail you. Right. But you got to believe him. Right. But whether there be prophecies, they'll fail. Right. Whether there be tongues, they'll cease. Right. They haven't, but they will. Yeah. Whether there be knowledge, it'll vanish away. For we know in part... And we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, then shall I know, even also, even as also I am known. He's talking about the Christ in you. And now abideth faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is God or love. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. That's divine love. That's God love. Yes. So the question then becomes, did Jesus reveal God or didn't he? Right. It's, it's time to realize and to act on the fact that Jesus is God in the flesh. Your Father is for you. And Jesus came to reveal that. There's no aspect of God, the Father, as defined, that's different from the grace that is demonstrated by Jesus Christ. Absolutely none. There is no separation. There is no division. They're one. Whatever you see in Jesus is God. That's the nature of God. It's the attitude of God. It's the love of God. It's, the, it's God's reaching for humanity. It's God's grace. And we can say praise the Lord because of it. Amen. I'm not mad at religious people. I don't, I'm not judging religious people. I'm just saying, just don't count me in that number. Yeah. Just don't try to measure me by your standards or your rules or your regulations. You want to keep them? God bless you. That's your business. But whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Amen? Amen. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise, the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. God bless you. God is great all the time. 
His grace is sufficient. Amen? And if you have any storm windows you need help with, call my wife. Hallelujah. You're dismissed in the matchless name of Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week, everybody.